thankful, my wife and me, my wife and I, for the opportunity to be able to be here with you guys. Man, it's been very, very special to us already. Your brother Aaron mentioned we got a chance to meet a number of years ago, and, and of course, uh, those who strive to live godly in Christ Jesus, those who strive to uh, be faithful to God's, God's word, to his church, and to the God of heaven, to respect his authority, but we gravitate toward one another. And I believe very firmly in holding on tight whenever we find sound, faithful brethren in the Lord. And so uh, we appreciate being here with you guys already. Uh, we had some cards that were sent to us weeks ago. Man, I've never had that happen before. And so I definitely want to tell whoever sent those cards. I'm not sure who it is, who it was, but we've got a number of cards that were sent to us from members of the church here just telling us, hey, we're excited about you guys coming. We look forward to it. And and like I said, in in 27 years of preaching the gospel, I've never had that happen before. And so that in and of itself is extremely special. And we just want to let you guys know that we appreciate that so very much. Appreciate the the love uh, that you guys sent ahead of our time here together. Just cannot express our thanks enough for that. And so we look forward to the week and being able to be with you all and be able to, to get to know you a little bit better. If we were to compile a list of interesting facts about Noah's Ark, that list would contain information such as this, the, the ark that God would commission Noah to build, which we read about in the book of Genesis chapter 6, was 450 feet in length. 450 feet in length. It was 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. Now, to put that in perspective, because as you sit there and think about, well, what is 450 feet, uh, 75 feet, maybe we can't conceptualize that wholly in our mind, just thinking about those figures and those facts uh, straight up. Think about football. Football, I'm sure there's some people in here that are some Arkansas State fans. we got Arkansas State fans in here by a show of hands. Anybody? All right, yeah, i got two hands went up back there. So they had a pretty good day on yesterday. I think you played against Southern Mississippi, won that game pretty handily, 44-28, I believe, was the final score. So you know a little bit about, about football. Ever been on that field before? All right, so you stood on that field. My wife and I have got a son that plays football for Texas A&M, and so we go stand on the field after every game. And It's been a long time until he started playing since I've been on a football field. And so standing on that field, uh, uh, actually it was last Saturday, me and one of the other fathers were talking about it, like, man, this field is long, and I don't remember it being this long back in the day. But it's a long field. But if you think about a football field, stand in one end zone and look down toward the other end zone and then add another half of a football field to that, and that will be the length of the arc. Pretty amazing, right? If you stand on one sideline, stand on one sideline of a football field, and you look all the way out to midfield, that will be 75 feet approximately. And so that's what you have there. If you think about a football field is, is divided in half lengthways, and then again, stand at one end zone, look all the way to the end of the other, and then add another half football field. This is a massive, a massive uh, floating device that God would have Noah to erect for the purposes that we'll talk about in just a moment. And so we see that in the book of Genesis chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. We go over to the book of Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 4. We know that whenever the flood begins, the Bible tells us that it would rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Of course, this is a fact and a figure that's very familiar to us all, maybe from the time we were very little children. <clears throat> we become familiar with the fact by way of the instruction of our parents, perhaps, or our Bible class teachers, that whenever God would bring about the flood on the world of the ungodly, to utilize the terminology of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5, that it would rain for 40 days and for 40 nights. And not only would it rain, but the Bible says God would break up the, the depths to also be included in what would be conducive to the flooding of the earth universally. And so we see that. You go over to the book of Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 6. And the Bible tells us there that Noah would have been 600 years old whenever God began to send the floods upon the earth. And of course, you go all the way to verse number 11 there. And we also find out that not only was he 600 years old whenever the floods began, but the Bible says that he would enter the ark with his wife and with his three sons and their wives in the second month of the 600th year and the the 17th day. So the second month, 17th day. This is going to be very significant to us in just a moment. 
And so we get those facts and those figures. We think about the size of the ark as we talked about a moment ago. Whenever you look at the, the volume of the ark in cubic feet, it's 1,396,000 cubic feet in volume. You know, there have been skeptics over in times past who have tried to make the argument that, well, we know that the, the, fl the flood account, the account of a universal flood, Noah is a farce, it's fictitious, because there's no possible way that all of the animals could have fit inside of the boat, if you will, that God would have Noah to build. But whenever you begin to calculate, and there have been different scientists who have calculated this information. Matter of fact, evolutionists, tax, um, tax, um, um, uh, taxonomous uh, Ernest Mayer calculated in 1980 a list that included 3,700 mammals, 8,600 birds, 6,300 reptiles, and 2,500 amphibians, 21,100 different species. Using these numbers, there would have been approximately 50,000 vertebrates on the ark if counting species. Now, species, we cannot forget the fact that the Bible says. Not that God would have Noah accumulate pairs of species. The Bible says he would have him accumulate pairs of kinds. And so that becomes very, very important to us if we understand that. And so he has this many species that he counts. If each animal was the size of about an adult sheep on average, and again, just keep that in mind, there would have been some that were a little bit bigger, and there would have been several that would have been quite a bit smaller than an adult sheep. But if, if each animal was the size approximately of an adult sheep, only 30 per, 30, 36 excuse me, percent of the ark's capacity would have been utilized. Let's put that in perspective real quickly. 240 sheep-sized animals can fit into one railroad box car. Now, probably every one of us here are old enough uh, that, that we have seen at some point in time a railroad boxcar before, maybe multiple times in our lives. And so keep that in mind. It, you got 200 or, or uh, that many sheep that could fit in a railroad boxcar, 240 sheep that can fit on one. The ox capacity was that of 520 boxcars. 520 boxcars fit 240 sheep-sized animals on one but the ark's capacity is 520. 124,800 animals the size of an adult sheep would have fit on the ark, and again, approximately 50,000 would have been on board if species are under consideration, and not kinds, but species. So in other words, the ark not only would accommodate all of the animals that God would have had Noah to bring onto it, but if there was space, plenty of space, even more space, for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of human beings, which is what the ark was initially built for in God's mind to begin with. God was trying to save humanity, or God's always been desirous of the salvation of humanity. And so why is Noah a preacher of righteousness, we hear in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5? Because God was interested in the salvation of humanity. He wasn't preaching to the sheep. He wasn't preaching to the dinosaurs wasn't preaching to, to the oxen or the camels. He was preaching to human beings. God desires men to be saved. And so, and so those are some facts, some facts about Noah's Ark. But of course, we know that whenever we go over to the book of Genesis chapter 6, it's not about just the accumulation of fun facts, as we, as we would say in Genesis chapter 6, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through chapter 9. That's not what it's about. We know that in the book of Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, the Bible says that whatsoever things are written, before time were written for our learning, right? So Paul, of course, has been talking in the book of Romans 14 about how that we ought to treat one another as human beings, how we, as members of the church in particular, of course, there's this conflict that's going on between the meat eaters and the vegetarians, and they're judging one another, and there's some problems that are arising as a result of the conflicting worldviews or doctrinal beliefs, or, or, or they're not really doctrinal beliefs, uh, expedient beliefs there, and so... Where that is concerned, God says you need to treat one another the right way, properly. Even if you have a liberty, it might be conducive uh, to the well-being of the congregation to forego a liberty if it's going to cause conflict among us. Of course, it's not including doctrinal matters. Romans 14 is not a doctrinal issue. It is a matter of opinion or of expediency. But whenever you get over to chapter 15, Paul continues in that vein of thought, verse number 1 to verse number 5. He hasn't changed 
the, the, the thought pattern there, the thought process. And he quotes from Christ and he wants them to understand that even Christ pleased not himself, but the reproaches of them that reproach you, Christ speaking to the Father, fell on me. And so the Bible says Christ sacrificed and he took the reproaches of the Father. They fell on him and he willingly endured them. And so how much more so should you and me, should we be willing to endure Hardship one for another. And it's in that vein of thought because Paul is quoting from an Old Testament scripture that he says, whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So with that in mind, what does God expect us to learn? Whenever we go back to the Genesis account of the universal flood, what does God expect us to learn? Our series of lessons for this week is messages from the mountains. Messages from the mountains. Very, very interesting topic. I didn't come up with it. It doesn't originate with me. I preached a gospel meeting a number of years ago in Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, and I asked a preacher who was a buddy of mine, well, what do you want me to preach on? What do we need to deal with? And he came up with this idea of messages from the mountaintop. Whenever you open up your Bible and you read about so many different mountains, right? We read of a, a literally scores of mountains whenever we open up the pages of Holy Writ. And at the School of Preaching in Texas, we have a class called Bible Geography. And so the students have to be familiar with one, where some of these geographical places are located. And they've got to be able to regurgitate that information on tests, fill out maps and things like that. But at the end of the day, we understand there's something much more important than just the geographical location of these mountains. But generally, God has conveyed some type of message that becomes absolutely critical to our lives and our ability to serve God the way that he wants to be served. And that's what the idea is about this week. What is it that God wanted us to understand? What messages did he want to convey to us where these mountains are concerned? Does he just want us to, be, to have the facts in our minds academically that there's a mountain that's under consideration here? Mount Ararat, the Bible says in the book of of Genesis chapter 8, verse number 4, or are there some things that we need to be able to learn from this particular account? Well, I would contest and contend that there are some things that God expects us to learn here. Perhaps he would want us to learn the exact same things that become apparent to Noah and his family as they would spend 225 days stationed at the top of Mount Ararat. The Bible will let us know that Whenever God will look and that he would see that the, that the condition of man was so wretched. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5. God looked and saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the imagination of the thoughts of his heart, every imagination rather, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now give that some thought, man. I've given this verse some thought many times. You look at the adjectives and the adverbs there in particular. And, and, and God really means to convey through the writing of Moses that man was in a very horrible condition at this particular time. Moral depravity had set in. It's really the, the situation that Paul describes in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 18, which we'll look at in just a moment. But, but man has become wicked incessantly. The Bible says every imagination of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. We know what the Bible says about the heart, right? In places like Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23, the Bible teaches us to guard the heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. We know the book of Proverbs teaches us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, right? Jesus Christ would be speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes, and he would let them know that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we see passages like this all over the Bible, and it tells us that we behave in accordance to, with and commensurate with how we think. And so if every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually, then can you imagine what is going on on the earth at this particular time? My friends, it's tragic. It's profound. To the point that God says, I'm going to destroy the place. I'm going to destroy the world with the flood. Everything that breathes upon this earth, everything that has the breath of air in his, in his nostrils, God says, I'm going to destroy it. It repented God that he had made man, the Bible says in verses 6 and 7. And so, again, it's a, a, a profound situation. Always said that drastic situations call for drastic measures. And certainly this is a drastic situation. And so God takes a drastic measure in order to be able to rectify this particular situation. That is what is going on. Whenever all this occurs and once Noah and once Mrs. Noah and once 
Sham, Ham, and Japheth and their three wives enter into this vessel again during the second month and the 17th day of the 600th year of Noah. Once they get into that vessel and once they are floating, once that thing begins to float and they're floating on this water for the amount of days that they are and then they begin to rest upon Mount Ararat whenever the, the waters finally stop and they begin to subside and, and the ark finds a resting place. That resting place again, the Bible says, is on the mountains of Ararat. Genesis chapter 8, verse number 4, the Bible tells us they will be there for 225 days approximately. They're in the ark for a total of about <clears throat> 375 days. Again, how do we know that? Because the Bible will tell us that it would be the seventh month and the 17th day in which you would rest there. Genesis 8, verse number 4. A little bit later on, you'll find out that after all is said and done, it becomes the, and this is verse number 14 of Genesis chapter 8, that they would have been in the ark uh, from Noah's 600th year, his second month, the 10th day, to the 601st year, the Bible says. All right? And, 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 and this, this, the second day in the 20, or second month, rather, in the 27th day. And so, again, you take a year and you add 10 days to that, approximately 375 days there in that ark, 225 of it. Again, they're stationed on Mount Ararat. What is going on in their minds? Take yourself to their situation. Put yourself in their location, brothers and sisters. Imagine being there on the ark with them. Imagine being stationed there for 225 days. There's an, a window that's in the ark. And whenever they would peer out of it, what would they see? We've all seen the children's books, have we not? You go to a bookstore, Barnes & Noble perhaps, you go to the religious section or to the child section, and they'll have books, Noah and the Ark, and they'll have this boat, and they'll have all these animals, giraffes and elephants, and, and all these things are sticking their heads out of the boat, and Noah's there, and, and Noah's got a smile, he's smiling from ear to ear, and all the animals are smiling from ear to ear. But my friends, that's really not an accurate depiction of the reality of what would have been going on on that boat at that time. Give that some thought. Give that some thought. What would they have been contemplating? What would they have been thinking about? Perhaps, number one, they would have been thinking about this, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Noah understood that it was God who created the heavens and the earth. We go over to the book of Genesis chapter 1, right? We're familiar with this text, at least we should be. Genesis chapter 1, and beginning in verse number 1, we'll probably all quote the first verse of the Bible in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, the book says. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And the Bible says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and the light God called day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And then God says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God, God made the firmament. He divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. The Bible says, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven in the evening and in the morning were the second day. But notice then, verse number 9, and God said that the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place that the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he the seas, and God saw that it was good. And so no doubt Noah and his family would have been familiar with this truth. They would have been familiar with the fact that the sovereign, almighty God of heaven, that he is the creator. And if he's got the ability to create the heavens and the earth, and if he's got the ability to be able to create the light and the darkness and all things that are contained within the universe and then set them into motion to where they are perfectly calibrated to be able to function until he says that they will not function any longer, <clears throat> then this is certainly a God who's got the right, who's got the authority, who's got the ability, who's got the sovereignty to be able to tell Noah that, look, I'm going to destroy this earth. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. I think about places like Psalm 24, verses number 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. This thing belongs to God. Psalm 50 lets us know that a cattle on, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. God is trying to impress upon the minds of the children of Israel that if I was hungry, I wouldn't ask you. All right, all of this belongs to me anyway. 
He made it. We're familiar with the book of John and how that he introduces the word to us. Jesus Christ, the son, he says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Listen to this. All things, verse number three, were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The word belongs to God. He made it. And as they peer out of the window of that ark and they see nothing but water for as far as they can see. They understand that God made this. Maybe their minds are taken back to, to what we see here. Did they have, did, you know, we know at this juncture they didn't have the revelation that we have known as the book of Genesis, but maybe that perhaps they certainly did know everything that we do know about the beginnings of the earth. And, and I think about what we just read. The earth at one point in time is engulfed in water, and so they're looking at the earth perhaps the way that it looked. Very similar to the way it looked whenever God first created the entire thing is engulfed in water to begin with. It's not to the third day that the Bible says God would separate the waters that were beneath the firmament that he calls heaven and allows dry land to appear. Right now at this point in time, there is no dry land that appears. They're looking out and all that they see is water. How, how interesting would that have been? How indicative of the great power and wonder and might of the God of heaven. He's sovereign. So many times when we look back through the annals of human history, we see that God has been the one that regulates the elements, the astronomical elements. I was just reading the other day in the book of Exodus how that during the, the conquest of Canaan, before they even get into the Canaan land, when, when they're winding down the, the wilderness wanderers, they get into a a fight the Israelites do with the Amalekites. And the Bible says that Joshua, who was the commander of the army at that particular time, that he would pray to God for the, the sun to be able to stand still in the sky. And the Bible says that it did for about a 24-hour period. The sun stands still in the sky. Who's got the ability to do that? Joshua didn't ask Moses to do it. He didn't try to do it himself. He didn't ask her or Aaron to do this. The Bible says that he prayed to the God of heaven. He's the one who's got the ability to do something like that. And, of course, we understand all has got to transpire in order for the sun to stand in one part of the sky and the moon to stand in the other part of the sky for a 24-hour period. This terrestrial ball in which we live is, is, is rotating, is circulating, and he's got to stop the rotation of the earth in order for that to happen. Very, very interesting, but guess what? God is able to do this in the book of Jeremiah. I think it's chapter 32, verse number 17. I may have that backwards. It might be 1732, but the Bible teaches us that Jeremiah says, O Lord God, thou hast created the heavens and the earth with thy power and thy outstretched arms. There is nothing that is too hard for thee. Nothing that is too difficult for God when we think about what it is that he has done already. Our God is a great God. He's a mighty and magnificent God. One of the most tragic occurrences in human life is when people turn their backs on the facts of these matters and they begin to dismiss God from the conscience right now in our, our country. My friends, we are laden with, with atheism in the world altogether. There's about one point 2 billion atheists. There's 8 billion people on the planet and about 1.2 billion of them are professed atheists. That is absolutely monumental. Never thought that we would reach a point like this. I remember when I was a child, I was telling someone just the other day that whenever I was young, I can remember having conversations about God just, I mean, you, you, it wouldn't be hard to do. You can find just about anybody on the street. You could have some type of conversation at some level about God, about the Bible, about the scriptures, and you would be able to hold an intelligent conversation. Guess what? That day is gone. That day is gone. You are very likely in any given day to encounter half the people who have no idea who the God of the Bible is, no idea who Jesus Christ, our King, is, have no idea what the Bible even says. And it's tragic. But whenever Noah and his family look out of the window of that ark, no doubt what's on their mind is the almighty sovereignty of God. Anytime that we see things occur that are, that are, that are, are just uh, profound to us, 
we think about God, we, we see sometimes natural disasters, and even though they are natural disasters, these things occur naturally, we still understand that God is the one who controls everything. Jesus Christ is the one who would come up out of the, the, the ship where he was resting whenever his disciples become frantic because they thought they were going to die. And I always think about this. You know, about four of these guys, at least four of them were fishermen. They were on the Sea of Galilee all the time, Peter and Andrew and James and John. And so if this storm that is going on is so profound that it causes these fishermen to say, Lord, save us lest we perish. Jesus Christ has got to wake up from his sleep. And when he does so, he says, oh, you have little faith. And then he tells the wind and the sea, peace be still. And that the Sea of Galilee became calm like a, like a sheet of glass. Whenever he says that, Jesus Christ, our God, has control over the elements, everything that exists. He's got control over it. So maybe that's the first lesson that God expects us to come to grips with as we study this account from Mount Ararat is that he is sovereign. But in the second place, here's what God no doubt wants to impress upon our minds. And no doubt he'd impress, impress this upon the minds of Noah and his family. Number two, his hatred for sin. His hatred for sin. My friends, we cannot allow this critical point to escape us. Because as Noah is there on that vessel with his family, and they have been contained in this thing for, for almost a year, and they've looked out, and again, it's not, not this, this, this child's book fantasy of everybody smiling and having a good time. As they look out, they realize our earth is destroyed. Everybody that we know has drowned. Maybe there are still corpses that are close enough in proximity to the ark. They're floating by, and maybe they can see these things. No vegetation appears because the Bible says that the waters would, would uh, go so high that they would be 22.5 feet, 15 cubits, 22.5 feet above the tallest mountain peak. There's nothing that can be seen, my friends, nothing. And they're looking at that and no doubt they're thinking, God has no love for wickedness. God cannot tolerate sinfulness. My friends, that is the facts of the matter. I know sometimes we like to gloss over that fact, and I know sometimes the world wants to dismiss it from their conscience, but it's there regardless. God hates wickedness. Back at chapter 1 and verse number 13, he can't even dwell in the midst of sin. He can't do it. His nature will not permit it. The Bible lets us know God is infinitely, infinitely good. He's infinitely holy. He's infinitely just. He cannot dwell in the midst of sin. He cannot tolerate it. Sometimes we get to where we can tolerate sin. We become desensitized to sin. Matter of fact, we live in a country and in a culture in which they strive diligently to try to desensitize you and me to sin. They take things that are heinous and are abominable. And they want to give it names and assign it, assign it different designations that make it as though it's not as wicked as it actually is. Abortion. Abortion. No, we abort missions. If we're soldiers and we get that commandment to do so, we abort missions. We don't abort children. Children have to be murdered if you want them to cease to exist. We need to call it what it is because God does. And he hates it. I know that because the Bible says so. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 16. 16 is God hates. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. You know what one of the things on that list is? I think it's the third thing on the list. It's hands that shed innocent blood. Can you imagine any blood? Can you think of any blood that is more innocent than a child that is still in the womb of its mother? And since 1973 in this country... Women and men have aborted 1.6 million babies per year. Per year. It's mind-boggling. 
But we want to dumb it down, right? We want to call it abortion. We want to call it a woman's right to choose, a woman's rights over her own body. I heard a politician say just the other day, I'm so glad he's got enough sense to say something like this. You know what? You might have control over your own body, but the body that's growing inside of you is not yours. It's not yours. It belongs to the child. It's not yours. But again, that's what's going on. Homosexual behavior, an alternative lifestyle. I've been here, I began hearing that when I was in my teen years. It wasn't as prevalent back then, but that's what they called it back then. An alternative lifestyle. Being in the closet is not all that bad. It's just an alternative lifestyle. God says it's an abomination. He said that in the Old Covenant, and he says the exact same thing, the exact same thing in the New Testament. For those who want to say, well, that was the Old Covenant God. That's the Old Testament God that says homosexual behavior is an abomination. Leviticus chapter 22, no, the New Testament God says the exact same thing in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse number 24 and going down to verse number 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse number 9, going down to verse number 11. The, the New Testament God, which is the Old Testament God, says the exact same thing. God cannot suffer wickedness. He cannot bear sinfulness. You know, the Bible tells us that if we as his children step out of the light of Jesus Christ and we step into darkness, that we sever our fellowship with God. First John chapter one, verse number six and seven. Why is that? Because God cannot suffer wickedness is why. We might get to where we can tolerate it, where we can stomach it, where we can palate it, where we can digest it. But God cannot, nor will he ever be able to. And so whenever Noah... And Mrs. Noah and their children and their daughters-in-law are looking out of that window that God would tell Noah to build into the ark. What are they seeing? What lessons are they learning? What messages are they receiving from the Almighty of heaven? Were well, they receiving the message that I cannot suffer wickedness? I cannot suffer wickedness. That's why Paul would tell the Athenians on Mars Hill during the second evangelistic mission recorded in Acts chapter 17, verse number 30 and verse number 31, after he talks about the foolishness of their idolatry, he says, God winked at this ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he's appointed a day in which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man which he has ordained. And he has given us assurance of that fact by having raised him from the dead. Can't suffer this. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And then finally, finally. And we cannot get out of this text without thinking about this beautiful fact. One of the messages that would have been obvious and apparent to Noah and his family and to you and me as we study this text together is that God is a God of mercy and grace. He's a God of mercy and grace. Because you remember, when you go back to Genesis chapter 6, and you look there at verse number 5 and how that God sees that the wickedness of man is great in the earth and every imagination of the thought of his heart is only evil continually. He decides that he's going to destroy this earth. Verse number 8 says, but Noah, but Noah, God is painting through the pen of Moses a contradistinction between what he sees in the majority and what he sees in this one man and his family. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. How did Noah find grace in the eyes of God? Well, the Bible says Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Same thing that God expects of all of us. Noah begat three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. He goes on to talk about what God instructs him, but notice verse number 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Go over to chapter 7. Notice verse number 5. Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. How did one man and his family find grace in the eyes of God? By doing what God commanded them. Every last one of us can find the same grace. The Bible says in the book of Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11 that the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared unto all men. It means it's readily available for all of humanity. But guess what? It does teach us that we have to deny ungodliness and we have to continue in righteousness. 
It's not available for everybody, but for those who will be obedient to God through faith in Christ. And so God doesn't destroy all of humanity. Again, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5 emphasizes that during the point in which God is judging the world, in which he is destroying the world, he saves eight people. Noah being one of those, the eighth person, when he brought in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And so God, that same mercy, that same grace is available for every last one of us. And that's